and we're here to learn about the Mediterranean biome. Greece is such an important part of world history. The islands are my favorite part of Greece. This is Journey into Wild Greece, the Mediterranean. To learn about the Mediterranean biome, we explored much of mainland Greece and several islands. Greece used to be one of the most important knowledge centers in the ancient world. It's so cool to see where all that Olympic spirit got its start. We went all over the Peloponnese Peninsula. In Meteora, we saw rock formations that used to be at the bottom of the sea. We traveled through the islands of Corfu, Milos, and Santorini, and on each island we found something unique. We began our month in the famous city of Athens. You can't come to Greece and not start in Athens. Athens is the capital of Greece, and it's one of the world's oldest cities. In classical times, Athens was the cool kid that everyone wanted to be friends with. It's still cool. Back then, the ancient Agora was the center of Athenian life. It was the town square. This is where you'd have found the brainy bunch of Athens. You know Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. These were ancient Greek philosophers who proposed many of the political ideals we use today. Socrates was a masterful question asker. This guy never answered a question straight on. He just returned the volley with another question, and another, and another. He would say, what do you mean by that? Or, what's the counter argument? Socrates was just trying to push his students to think smarter and have deeper discussions. Socrates wasn't writing things down, but his friend Plato sure was. Plato's The Republic is the ultimate political science manual. In it, Plato describes a utopian society led by philosopher kings. Aristotle was Plato's student, and he was not one to let a conversation end. So typical of a philosopher. Aristotle was always walking what he taught and his students just followed him around. Do you like the theater? Well, drama actually started here in Athens at the theater of Dionysus. Yep, it was the birthplace of tragedy and comedy. Ancient Athens was known for all kinds of art. And the Greeks didn't just entertain, they educated. These plays dealt with the human condition, morality, the cosmic drama of life. Basically, it was like therapy for the ancient soul. Tragedy comedy, the three-act structure, the use of masks, all of this was straight out of ancient Greece. Wow, drama was definitely in their DNA. I guess they passed the script down to us. Looking back at my education, I can remember when my school took me to Greece to learn about philosophy in the ancient Agora. Oh wait, no, no, that never happened. Athens, oh my goodness, we loved walking around these ancient monuments with our kids. We learned about philosophers, artists, and historical trendsetters. The Acropolis was Athens' VIP section. The Acropolis is a rocky outcrop, high above the rest of the city. In 5th century BC, the who's who of Athens decided to dazzle up the Acropolis with some top-tier architecture. It was a flex of power and wealth. It was also a nod to the Greek gods and goddesses. And it was definitely a tribute to Athena. She was the goddess who Athens was named after. Athenian designers joined forces to create an all-new, incredible structure on the Acropolis. They called it the Parthenon. It was like a mega birthday gift for the goddess Athena. She was also the guardian of the city. Construction kicked off in 447 BC. And nine years later, the Parthenon was open. 
Acropolea is the grand entrance to the Acropolis. It's like a big gateway that acts as a red carpet. What an impressive design. You gotta make an entrance, right? Columns, friezes, pediments, they were all designed to showcase Athens culture. The Acropolis was many things over history. A temple, a Christian church, and a mosque. The Parthenon has been through wars, invasions, and a lot of thieves. We were lucky enough to get a personal tour of the Acropolis Museum from the guy who's the director of excavations for the entire Acropolis. We explored what happened during the famous, or rather infamous, Lord Elgin's art heist. He was a dude from England who took a liking to the Parthenon's decor. So he ripped the marble straight off the Parthenon. This guy marched all this Greek artwork back to England. Now it lives in the British Museum. His heist is still causing protest about who gets to keep the loot. This is ancient Greek artwork that wasn't sold to England. It was stolen. Greece wants the pieces of the Parthenon back. Please? One place to start our journey around Greece. Nestled at the base of the Acropolis is a little village called Plaka. It's an old neighborhood and it's all about those cozy Greek vibes. Blue and white are important colors in Greece. You see them everywhere. They often show up in something called the evil eye. Funny enough, it's not evil. It's about being protected from evil. The evil eye symbol is used as a talisman to keep away misfortune. Though we personally don't believe in this, it's fascinating to learn about the superstitions of an ancient Greek culture. We decided to get some traditional Greek sandals to add a little Greek style. They weren't that comfortable, but we did feel connected to history while wearing them. Plaka is postcard perfect. My favorite Greek food is called Heroes. Heroes are a Greek version of a taco. It's quick, casual food, and people eat it on the go. Heroes are made with warm, fluffy pita bread. They are then filled with beef, lamb, or chicken, which is cooked on a vertical rotisserie. When it cooks, it gets all juicy and crispy. Flavor explosion. But wait, there's more. They add tzatziki sauce, cucumber yogurt, and garlic. Then they add toppings, tomatoes, lettuce, onions, and potato wedges. I like to eat mine with grilled tulumi cheese. Yum! I love sports, and what better place to talk about sportsmanship in one of the oldest stadiums in the world. The Panathenaic Stadium. Back in 776 BC, the Greeks thought, hey, let's invite all the city-states and throw a big party. Maybe we could not fight, you know, just play some sports and hang out and have fun. Those ancient Olympics were a very big deal. It was like the World Cup, the Super Bowl, and the Grand Slam all rolled up into one. They happened every four years. And it went on for 1,200 years. The Panathenai Games actually came after the ancient Olympics. This stadium is made entirely of gleaming white marble, and it dates back to the 4th century BC. They were all about showing athleticism in honor of, who else? Athena! What's not to love about this horseshoe shape, these towering marble tiers, and these classic arches? They had track and field, wrestling, boxing, horse and chariot races, they, they had it all. We ran around racing each other and practicing winning awards. It was awesome. The athletes competed in their birthday suits. <laughs> the Greeks celebrated the human body as a form of art. You can just imagine the cheering crowds. 
They also had music and poetry competitions for the artistic type, like me. The artists also had their time in the spotlight at this stadium. This place is where athletes competed for eternal glory, or an olive branch crown. Every Sunday, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in front of the Parliament Building comes alive with a ceremony presented by the elite Presidential Guard. These guys create quite a spectacle. They wear a skirt type of garment with 400 pleats. Each of these pleats represent one of the 400 years they were under Ottoman rule. The pom-pom is about the cry for freedom. The hats are similar to the ones that the soldiers wore in the Greek War of Independence. The show is kind of like a tap dance. It's so fun. Road trip time. From Athens, we headed out to explore the mainland of Greece. First up, the Peloponnese Peninsula. I want to be a geologist when I grow up, so I want to learn all about the Fourth Canal. Even from classical times, leaders wanted to find a way to cut a passage through the peninsula. That way, ships wouldn't have to go all the way around the peninsula to get to and from Athens. This would save them 430 miles of sailing. There is a problem. Everyone that tried to dig the canal seemed to die. There was an ancient philosopher in Greece who predicted that anyone who tried to dig the Corinth Canal would be asking for trouble. Not one, not two, but three Roman rulers tried to tackle this project. But all three ended up dead shortly after they started. Julius Caesar? Assassinated. Caligula? Gone. Nero? Died. Herodotus Atticus? <laughs> nope. The canal was finally open after almost 2,000 years of trying to get the job done. This canal is so cool. This is the inside of our Earth's crust. You've got to see it. But it's tough to navigate, and it takes more than an hour to pass through. We saw people cruising through it in a hot tub. We saw other people bungee jumping off the bridge. Crazy! Not far from the canal are the ruins of Corinth, which was of great importance in ancient times. In 730 BC, Corinth was at the crossroads of some of the most important trade routes in the world. And with it, it became powerful and very wealthy. It was a diverse place with people from all over the ancient world. You might have heard stories about the Corinth from the Christian Bible. There was a teacher named Paul who was spreading the Christian faith in the first century all around Corinth. Paul's teaching to the citizens of Corinth are now core pieces of Christian theology. An hour or so south from Corinth is my favorite city in Greece. It's called Naplio. Naplio is a classic Greek village. It's all about those pretty streets, lazy cats, and taverns overflowing with live music. We went to Naplio because we met a friend in Athens who told us that Naplio was one of the best examples of a traditional Greek village. Traveling with an open-ended calendar allows us the freedom to be able to follow up on tips like this when locals tell us where to go and what to see. And our friend was right. Natfleo is about as dreamy as Greece gets. We stayed in a boutique hotel near the city center. The city comes to life after sunset. It's cooler then and everybody comes out to eat and chat. Even children were out playing and eating after way past bedtime. It's all part of the Greek way of life. Greeks enjoy a Mediterranean diet. They eat a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables, olives, figs, fish, you know, all the good stuff. 
We always try to explore where food comes from. We found that when kids get onto a farm and they start to learn how something is grown, they have a whole new appreciation and love for that food. All around Greece, we see olives, olive oil, and olive wood being used in products. We went to the olive farm in Kalamata to see where the best olives come from. We learned how to appreciate good olive oil and how to use it wisely. From Olympia, we headed up to Meteora. Meteora is a fascinating place, unlike anywhere we've ever been. These are towering cliffs that used to be at the bottom of a seafloor. I love collecting rocks, so Meteora was a dream to visit. Some of the rock formations in Meteor are over 300 meters high. That's over a thousand feet. Can you guess what's on top of the cliffs? Monsters, monks and nuns and everything. Millions of years ago, there was probably two rivers here and this was the delta where they met. Over time, the rivers built up sediment, which created these huge rocks. Meteora was one of the Earth's top showpieces. It was art. The tectonic plates decided to do a little dance. The Earth shifted and the rocks were pushed straight up from the ocean floor. The waters eventually receded and they left these beautiful rock formations in the most unusual of places, right in the middle of mainland Greece. The rocks became Matera. Let's talk about these monasteries of Matera. Back in the 9th century, there were some monks who were feeling a little bit adventurous. They decided, hey, we're going to settle in these rocks in the caves. They were seeking isolation so they could feel closer to God. In the 14th century, some other monks decided, hey, let's build up there and have some amazing views. But there was a big problem. How would they get up there? They used ladders, nets, and a whole lot of creative thinking. The word Matera itself means suspended in air. Soon, there were 24 monasteries on different cliffs. Were they competing to see who could get higher in the clouds? Things got a little rocky in the 19th century. World War II happened and all of Europe was under siege. The monks hid Jews and precious artifacts in the monasteries. And wouldn't you know it, the Nazis came knocking. Miraculously, most of the monasteries survived the war. Today, there are seven monasteries you can visit, each with a small entrance fee. It's a long walk up all those steps. But the view is so worth it. The monks and nuns are very kind and welcoming. Those dudes are really living on the edge. These monasteries really seem to defy gravity. How they managed to build these architectural masterpieces on these cliffs, it's a mystery. Matera offers a beautiful mix of these incredible rock formations and peaceful monasteries. The monasteries show us unbelievable human determination. I love Matera. After 40 countries, this is one of my new favorite places. After Metiera, we drove four hours west, got onto a car ferry, and arrived at the beautiful island of Corfu. Corfu is part of the Ionian Island Group, which is just off the west coast of mainland Greece. Corfu has green blue waters and lush greenery. Our favorite house was in a teeny village called Ana Pavliano. It was way up on the mountain and so peaceful. This was a beautiful house, right in the middle of a traditional Greek village. 
It had three bedrooms, two bathrooms, a living room, a kitchen, and a gorgeous balcony with views to the sea. There are over 6,000 Greek islands, and Corfu is just one of them. Wow, imagine all that Greece has to offer. Corfu Town is the main city on the island. The towns of Corfu are small, mostly coastal, and surrounded by olive groves. So it makes sense why they produce some of the best olive oil in the world. The beaches of Sidari and Glyfada offer beautiful white sands, sparkling waters, and trendy beach cafes. Swimming, hiking, snorkeling, that's the best way to experience the Greek islands. But driving in Corfu is hectic. These streets are so very old, and they were made for donkeys, not cars. What's happening here, Jed? Uh, it's a rental. It's a rental? Yeah, the car is a rental. Well, I put with the 10 miles on it. Yeah, we got it with 10 miles on it. We're just breaking it in, checking the suspension. <laughs> is this even a road? Yeah. What's happening? Uh -huh. so Look, it looks like a road to me. Sometimes there were only inches on either side of our car as we drove. I couldn't breathe. Oh my gosh! So stressful! Hold on, this is nuts. They want me to take this car in this road with this wind. This is crazy. And this is a rental. If I bust it, I'm, I'm gonna pay. My dad is the best driver ever. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> well at the beach, we met some Greeks who invited us to a festival in their village. We love being invited into local life, and we embrace the opportunity to learn everything we can. In the town plaza, the villagers were gathered. Food was everywhere. The Greeks love good food, and plenty of it. For festivals, Greeks often roast lamb on the spit. This is called souvlaki. The scent of souvlaki draws everyone together and creates a festive atmosphere. It's mouth-watering for most, but I'm a vegetarian. No thanks. There were games for children, and a band played traditional Greek music. Bazooki, guitar, accordion, and violin. We were soon pulled into the Koros, which is a spiral-shaped Greek dance where everyone holds hands and moves around together. The Greeks told us that dancing together creates a sense of unity in the village. It was awesome learning the Greek dance. Opa! Next, we took off to the island of Milos. Milos' most famous natural feature is called Syrikinico. The white volcanic rock has created a moonscape effect, which is just perfect for exploring with kids. It looks like you're walking on the moon. The rocks are smooth and they gleam in the sunlight. The hot white rocks are set against the perfectly cool turquoise waters. As a rock lover, Serakinico was just awesome. One of our favorite villages in Milos Island is Kilma. Kilma is a fishing village with colorful boat garages known as Sermata. They're built right into the rocks of the shoreline. The fishermen use them to store boats and equipment, and they also live above them. It's a picture of traditional Greek fishing life. We took the ferry boat between islands as much as we could. It made it so easy. The views looking over the Mediterranean, gorgeous. We packed all of our things in our car, drove onto the boat, took a ride, drove off. Hey, it was that simple. When most people think of Greece, they probably think of white, cave-like houses with blue domes. Santorini is the most beautiful island. In Greek, its name is Theatre. Santorini isn't just famous because it's beautiful. It's got a fascinating history that sweeps all the way back to the Bronze Age. Santorini is gorgeous. Tiny streets overflowing with cafes and art galleries. 
So much to see. Get this, in 1600 BC, there was one of the most powerful volcanic eruptions recorded in human history. And it happened right here on this island. The volcano reshaped the island into a crescent-shaped form called a caldera, and it actually wiped out the ancient civilization that was living there. A caldera is a submerged volcanic crater. This is what makes Santorini so pretty. Many people take donkeys to climb the giant cliffs. Some say Santorini is the lost city of Atlantis. This is a theory that the philosopher Plato came up with. There's a lot about it that fits what Plato wrote. The geography, the volcano, the ancient civilization. How exciting! Could it be the lost city of Atlantis? We took the girls to scuba dive and snorkel around the base of Santorini's volcano. Scuba diving in Santorini, we had to go with, you know, a former Greek Navy SEAL. Well, who else? Underwater, there are rock formations, cliffs, and caves to explore. Again, thanks to all those volcanic eruptions. There's also thermal springs near the volcano. Underwater steam vents of hot water, so fun. The Mediterranean Sea is nutrient deficient. This is because of overfishing and over tourism. But because of the volcanoes, the ecosystems around Santorini have a diverse array of marine life. There was jellyfish, octopus, and lots of colorful fish. Many species here are endemic. They're only found in this region. While we were in the Greek islands, we had a chance to learn about some of the problems that are facing the sea turtles and some of the conservation efforts surrounding them. When we got back to Athens, we stopped in at the Sea Turtle Rescue Center. They protect sea turtles and their homes. Many sea turtles get caught in fishing gear, like nets and lines. They are also hurt by ocean pollution. Plastic, oil, and pollution in the water all mean sea turtles are in danger. For 40 years, this place has rescued sea turtles and rehabilitated them. They also monitor the sea turtles after they release them. And they can understand what problems they face. I decided to adopt a sea turtle and track its progress over time. We want to teach the kids to be part of the solution and not the problem. It's not enough to know about these issues. We have to act. Visiting Greece with kids was an unbelievable experience. Out of all the countries I've been to, I think Greece is one of my top favorites. For me, Greece strikes a perfect balance between relaxation and education. There's so much to see and experience here, and honestly, it's just dreamy. I want to come back to Greece every year. I'll never forget all the incredible memories we made in Greece. This is Journey into Wild Greece, the Mediterranean.